you're going to learn about the water cycle. This cycle is important because the cycle transports water from the oceans to the atmosphere, to the land, and then back to the oceans. Without this cycle, the land would be so dry that nothing could live on it. This chart shows the basic facts about the water cycle. First fact, when water evaporates, it goes from a liquid to a gas. Here's what happens. The molecules in water are moving around. Some of them fly off into the air. This is water in the gas phase, called water vapor. Once more, when water evaporates, it goes from a liquid to a gas. Next fact, water evaporates faster at higher temperatures. Remember, when we increase the temperature, we speed the molecules. So they fly off into the air at a faster rate. If we make the water very hot, they fly off at an incredible rate. If the water is very cold, near freezing, evaporation still takes place, but much slower. Remember, evaporation takes place at all temperatures, but at low temperatures, it is very slow. Once more, when water evaporates, it goes from a liquid to a gas, and water evaporates faster at higher temperatures. Next fact. Colder air can't hold as much water vapor as hotter air. A given volume of air can hold only so much water vapor. Inside this container is water and perfectly dry air with no water vapor in it. The temperature of the air is 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Watch what happens. The water evaporates, but after a while, no more water is added to the air. The air can hold only so much water vapor. Here's another container with air that is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Watch. This air can't hold as much water vapor as the hotter air. Remember, colder air can't hold as much water vapor as hotter air. With these facts about water and air, we can explain the water cycle. The process starts with the sun. The sun heats the surface of the earth. Water evaporates into the air. The air near the surface is heated, and it expands. So what happens to its density? Yes, the density decreases. What will this less dense air do? Yes, it will rise. And when air rises, what happens to its temperature? Yes, when air rises, it cools. Which can hold more water vapor, hotter air or colder air? Yes, hotter air. Colder air can't hold as much water vapor as hotter air. As the air rises, it gets colder. When the air gets cold enough, it can't hold all the water vapor that's in it. So the water vapor condenses and forms tiny droplets. Millions of tiny droplets in the air make clouds. If there's enough condensed water in a cloud, the tiny droplets bang into each other and form bigger and bigger droplets. When they get big enough, they start to fall. That's rain. Remember, the air near the Earth's surface is hotter than the air higher in the atmosphere. Colder air can't hold as much water vapor as hotter air. So, if the surface air starts out with a lot of water vapor, the air will have more water vapor than it can hold when the air rises and gets cold. That's when water vapor condenses and clouds form. When rain falls, the rainwater collects in streams and underground waterways. As it returns to the oceans, it picks up salts and other minerals from the rocks and carries them to the oceans. You can taste them in seawater. This cycle has gone on for millions of years, and that is why the oceans are salty. Remember these facts about the water cycle. You've heard about relative humidity. Here's how it works. We start with the rule about hotter air and colder air. Which can hold more water vapor? Yes, hotter air. Colder air can't hold as much water vapor as hotter air. 
Let's show the water a hotter air mass can hold with this container. Here's the amount of water a colder air mass the same size can hold. The hotter air mass can hold this much water and no more. The colder air mass can hold only this much water and no more. As the hotter air mass cools, the container gets smaller. The colder the air gets, the less water it can hold. Remember, the containers show the amount of water vapor air can hold. A large container represents hotter air, air that can hold more water vapor. A smaller container represents colder air, air that can't hold as much water vapor. Here are containers for three air masses of the same size. Which container represents the hottest air mass? Yes, B is the largest container, so it represents the air that is the hottest. That's the air that can hold the most water vapor. Which container represents the coldest air mass? Yes, A is the coldest air. The container can hold only this much water vapor. Here are containers that show the amount of water vapor an air mass can hold. If air holds all the water vapor it can hold, it holds 100% of the water vapor it can hold. The container is full. But air does not always contain all the water vapor it can hold. Sometimes the air contains only 50% of the water it can hold. Sometimes the air contains only 25% of the water vapor it can hold. The percentages tell about the relative humidity. If air is holding all the water it can hold at a certain temperature, it has a relative humidity of 100%. If air is holding only 50% of the water it can hold at that temperature, the relative humidity is 50%. And if the air is holding 25% of the water it can hold, what's the relative humidity? Yes, 25%. Remember, a container shows how much water vapor an air mass can hold at a certain temperature. The hotter the air, the larger the container. How full the container is shows the relative humidity. If the air mass is holding all the water vapor it can hold, the container is full, and the relative humidity is 100%. If the air is holding half the water vapor it can hold at that temperature, the relative humidity is 50%. The container is half full. If the air is holding 70% of the water vapor it can hold, what's the relative humidity? Yes, 70%. You've learned why clouds form. The air cools until it contains more water vapor than it can hold at that temperature and the water vapor condenses to form tiny droplets. The same thing that happens above the ground happens closer to the ground. During the day, the air is hotter than it is at night. So when can the air hold more water vapor, during the day or at night? Yes, during the day. Let's say that a mass of air picks up this much water during the day. What's the relative humidity of the air? Yes. 75%. At night, the air cools. Watch what happens. As the air cools, the container gets smaller. When the air reaches 100% relative humidity, water vapor starts to condense. A cloud that forms close to the ground is called fog. When droplets of water form on the ground, it is called dew or frost. Dew usually forms at night, when the surface is much colder than the air. The air that comes in contact with the surface is cooled a lot and large droplets form. That's dew, or in freezing weather, frost forms. Fog forms the same way. The ground cools, a warmer air mass close to the ground cools and stays close to the ground. After a while, the air can't hold all the water vapor it contains. Some of it condenses and forms a cloud that is close to the surface. That's fog. Remember, fog is a cloud close to the ground. Frost and dew are like raindrops that form on the surface. Here are some facts about air masses. An air mass is a large volume of air. 
An air mass can be hotter or cooler than the surrounding air masses. The air mass can have a higher relative humidity or a lower relative humidity than the surrounding air masses. If air masses that are different are next to each other, there is a boundary between them. That boundary is called a front. Remember, a front is the boundary between two air masses that are different in temperature and usually different in relative humidity. Here's another fact about air masses. They move around and change shape. They are driven by the winds and are pushed around by other air masses. Here's a warm air mass over the ocean. It can hold this much water and it is holding this much water. So the air is fairly humid. What's the relative humidity of this air mass? Yes, 50%. The air is holding 50% of the water vapor it could hold at that temperature. The air reaches the land and comes to a chain of mountains. It keeps moving east, but the only way it can do that is to go over the mountains. What happens to the temperature of the air as it rises? Yes, the temperature goes down. The air gets colder. Can this air hold as much water vapor as it held when it was warmer? Right, it can hold only this much water vapor, but there is still this much water in the air. So what will happen to some of this water vapor? The water vapor condenses, clouds form, and it rains. So the air at the top has a relative humidity of 100%. And that air is pretty cold because it is far above sea level. As the air goes down on the other side of the mountain, will it become colder or hotter? Yes, hotter. As it gets hotter, what happens to the amount of water this air can hold? Right, it can hold more water vapor. So the relative humidity goes down and down and down. At the bottom of the mountain, the relative humidity is less than 10%. The air is very dry. Air is forced over mountains in the western part of the United States. Here's a chain of mountains. The wind blows from west to east, and a lot of rain falls on the western side of the mountains as the air masses rise over them. The air on the other side of the mountains is very dry. This is a desert. It almost never rains here. Remember these facts about air masses. The same thing that happens with air masses and mountains happens at the boundaries between air masses. Remember, the boundary between two air masses is called a front. There are two different kinds of fronts. A front is named after the air that is moving into an area. If cold air is moving into an area occupied by a warm air mass, the air that is moving in is cold air, and the front is called a cold front. If warm air is moving into an area occupied by colder air, the warm air is moving. What is the front called? Yes, a warm front. Remember, a front is named after the air mass that is moving into an area. A warm front works just like air moving over the mountains. When the warm air moves in, it is pushed up just as if it had run into an invisible mountain. The warmer air rises because it is less dense than the colder air. What happens to the temperature of the rising air? Yes, it goes down. As the temperature goes down, can the air hold as much water vapor as it held when it was warmer? Right, it can't hold as much water vapor. Some of it condenses. Clouds form and there is rain along the front. Remember, the warm front looks just like an invisible mountain, but with one difference. Because the warm air is on the move, it pushes the cold air mass this way. That's why the weather changes. The weather is moving through your area all the time. Here's another fact about fronts. The greater the difference in the temperature of the air masses, the more violent the weather is at the front. If the warm air mass is only slightly hotter than the colder air mass, there may be some rain and clouds at the front. If the hotter air is very hot and very humid, while the colder air is very cold and very dry, 
There will be violent weather at the front. There will be great winds, tremendous thunderstorms with lightning and sometimes tornadoes. Remember, the greater the difference in the air masses, the more violent the weather is at the front. Here's a rule about high pressure areas and low pressure areas. As air masses move around in the atmosphere, the highs and lows move with them. That means if we are standing here on the surface, the pressure will increase and it will decrease as air masses of different types move over us. We're in Chicago and here comes a high pressure area. When the high first hits us, it's pulling air from the north, which is colder air. If it's winter time, this may be bad news, very cold. Now we're right in the middle of the high pressure area. There's not a lot of wind. As the high pressure area moves past, we now have winds that come from the south. This air has been down south where it's warmer, so the weather gets warmer. Here's a low that follows the high. Remember, the air moves counterclockwise into the low, possibly creating big winds if the low pressure area is very low. Once we're in the low, there may be local winds, but there may be no winds at all. And as the low passes us, we get air that is pulled down from the north, colder air. And if we look at what's behind the low, we see that there is another high. And behind that high is another low. The areas of high pressure are about 600 miles across. They move from west to east, and they move at the rate of about 30 miles per hour. During some parts of the year, this is the basic pattern of weather in the northern hemisphere. But here's a situation that may occur in late summer. This is an area of hot air that is rising very, very fast. So it's an area of what kind of pressure? Yes, very low. It is surrounded by cool, high pressure air. As the air rushes from high to low, in which direction will it rotate? Yes, counterclockwise. And here are satellite pictures of what happens. This is a hurricane. The center is calm. Around the outside are winds that may reach 130 miles an hour. And you can see the rotation of the clouds. You've seen how highs and lows move across the United States. In addition to the smaller highs and lows, there are three major air masses that affect weather in North America. They are the Canadian air mass, the Pacific air mass, and the Gulf air mass. During different seasons, these air masses move and push each other around. They create fronts. Remember, the front is named after the air mass that is moving forward. During the winter, the air from Canada moves down. Canadian air is cold and dry. It's cold because it blows from up here, near the poles. It is dry because it originates over the land. As it moves down, cold air is advancing, so we have a cold front. During the summer in North America, the Gulf air pushes forward in this direction. This air is hot and wet. It's hot because it originates down here, closer to the equator. It is wet because it originates over the ocean and picks up a lot of water vapor. When Gulf air pushes forward, what is the front called? Yes, a warm front. During both summer and winter, Pacific air pushes across from time to time. It is cool and wet. It's warmer than Canadian air because it originates over a cool ocean, not over a cold continent. It is wet, but not as wet as Gulf air because it is not as warm and can't pick up as much water vapor. The Pacific air usually does not move inland very far, but from time to time it pushes forward. When it comes in contact with the Gulf air, what kind of front occurs? Yes, a cold front. When the Pacific air comes in contact with Canadian air, what kind of front is it? Yes, a warm front. The Pacific air is warmer than the Canadian air, but colder than the Gulf air. 
When Canadian Air and Gulf Air come in contact, there is a great difference in the temperature and humidity of the air masses at the front, so there is very violent weather. There may be great winds and a lot of rain at the front. The weather at Pacific air fronts is not as violent because the difference in the air masses is not as great. Remember, the greater the difference in air masses, the more violent the weather is at the front. Let's review. There are three major air masses affecting North America. During the summer, which air mass moves forward? Yes, Gulf air. And what kind of front is created? Yes, a warm front. During winter, Canadian air moves forward, and there is a cold front. Which of these three air masses has the coldest air? Yes, Canadian air. Which mass has air that is next coldest? Yes, Pacific air mass. Which air has the air that is the hottest? Yes, Gulf air. Which air mass is the driest? Yes, Canadian air. Both Pacific Air and Gulf Air are wet. Which is usually the wettest air? Yes, Gulf Air. Remember these facts.